There we Go. Oh. Oh. Right, so no one's on Zoom. That's unusual. Okay. Um, so my plan was to do the other case study today. I'm going to wait a couple minutes to see if other people roll in, just because I know it's easier when we have more people to do a case study. Um, and then, uh, we will just go ahead and get started for now. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen. I'm trying to be more on top of posting the videos. So there is one that got blocked because I showed that one clip from SNL. So NBC copyright struck it. And I'm like, I'm not even trying to get monetized. Like, who cares? So I'll have to try to take that one down and re-edit it. But um, I've been trying to be better about getting them up more efficiently. So today, um, we're still talking about neurological disorders. And so various different... Uh, Disorders that we don't necessarily think of as like, these are neuropsych per se, right? But we do know that these cause issues. These Some of these can be very debilitating for people as well. Um, and so they become really important for us to cover. So give me just a sec because I can't do two things at once and I'm going to just take attendance all the way here and then we'll go from there. Alrighty. Yeah. So, um, I'm gonna save the stroke bit just because um, if we talk about the case study, we'll be talking about that. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about epilepsy. Um, and I know we talked about this a teeny bit at the beginning of the semester, but it's always good to review things and also go into a little more detail. So epilepsy is essentially just recurrent seizures and um, you can have symptomatic or idiopathic seizures, and some people have both kinds. Symptomatic are seizures where you, there's a cause. You can say like, this is what's causing this person to have a seizure. And idiopathic just appear out of nowhere. So the most common symptoms to sort of warn people uh, of what's going on uh, is an aura and this is similar to a migraine. We're gonna talk about migraines today too. Migraines also have an aura. And this is just people who have epilepsy start to get used to their body essentially telling them, hey, there's a seizure coming on. Sometimes there's loss of consciousness with seizures and the movement is the biggest thing. People tend to think of like grand mal, clonic tonic seizures with large movements. That being said, that is not the only type of seizure. Um, and we're gonna talk about the different types. Epilepsy is the one diagnosis where EEG is the most helpful type of brain imaging um, because it specifically looks at brain waves and things along those lines. So there are different types of seizures. One is focal. And so this begins in one place and then spreads. Um, and you can have more specifically Jacksonian focal seizures, which begin with movement in one part of the body and then spread. You can have a complex partial seizure. That's about it. And this is subjective experiences before the seizure. You have postural changes, you have automatisms. 
And then there's a generalized seizure. And this is where it's bilateral. It's not one side of the brain, it's symmetrical. The type that people don't think about as much are the petite mall seizures, which literally translates from French to little bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and this is where you basically kind of blank out and you have a loss of awareness. There's no motor activity in contrast to the ones we're just about to talk about, uh, except for maybe blinking or rolling the eyes or turning the head. Petite mall seizures also tend to be a more brief duration than some of the other ones we talk about. And I have videos that are going to show what these look like. The ones we think of when we think of seizures are grand mal seizures, which literally translates to big bad. Um, these are uh, where the person is, typically they fall to the ground, there is limb movement, convulsion essentially, they have a tonic and a clonic stage, there's also a push seizure stage, some people will get auras beforehand. And then in kids, sometimes we have what are called akinetic seizures. And these are where a kiddo will just collapse without any warning. And then finally, there's the myoclonic spasms. And this is a massive seizure that has sudden flexation or extension of the whole body. And so again, I have various clips of um, different types of seizures that I'm gonna show here now. After the end. Lash I had mascara from Maybelline, New York. Limitless lash altitude. Flex tower brush. Just a sec, I just realized I never turned on our Zoom captions. Since this video doesn't have captions, it'll be a little helpful. All right, so they're gonna show this guy like pretending to have various seizures. The tonic phase is that sort of immobility initial phase. And then the clonic phase is where you actually have what we think of as the seizure, right? The, the violent movements. And then the seizure will stop. Sometimes they'll lose consciousness. Sometimes they'll be able to talk to you. And when they have something like that type of seizure, sometimes they lose control of their like bowels and things like that. Um, so the one student who actually had a grand mal seizure during this class once, what she was most embarrassed about is that she lost bladder control during it. And like, none of us cared. We were just glad she was alive, right? But like, she mentioned that to me later. So this is one of those myoclonic ones. The muscles and the limbs and face. I think they're showing like people whose friends know they have seizures, which is good, right? So they're able to respond and take care of them. And this is one of those atonic ones.
This is a simple partial. So maybe one side of the body. And again, they have consciousness during that. And that's an absence where again, their eyes might roll. They just sort of don't move and then they're back to normal, essentially. And a lot of people don't necessarily recognize that as a seizure. Seizure stops. Very cute students making these, sometimes with typos. <laughs> sometimes they can manifest as just like laughing. Right. So it can be really hard, especially if you don't have the typical grand mal seizures, right, to realize what's happening to that person. This is another example of an absence seizure. And I nearly finished, but I didn't do my picture. And I was on the last, um, on the last page now, I'm on the second the second dark book. The second. The second dark red book. Yeah. Because I'm on number two book now. And if I'm on number three, uh -uh, I finish all of them. And then I will say. So again, you can see this kid is very active, very like communicative, and then it's like he just is gone for a minute, not even a minute. And that's how quickly it can end. I'm not, oh. And what can be really hard, you know, until you get in and get an EEG and get diagnosed is that that can look almost identical to someone having a TIA, a mini stroke, right? And so, like, sometimes you have to do a lot of investigation to figure out what's going on there, essentially. Uh, I thought this one was really helpful. I found this one after the student did have a seizure in my course of, like, what can you do if someone near you is having a seizure? What do you know what to do? We could all help someone who is having a seizure. During a tonic-clonic seizure, the person goes stiff, loses consciousness, falls to the floor, and begins to jerk or convulse. And so I should say that grand mal seizures are sometimes called tonic clot. So that's what they're talking about here. Because it has that initial tonic stage, so they sort of have the immobility. Then they go into the clonic stage, which is what we're seeing here. They may look a little blue around their mouth from irregular breathing. Don't panic, just take the appropriate action. Assess the situation. Are they in danger of injuring themselves? Remove any nearby objects that could cause injury. Cushion their head to protect them from head injury. Check the time. If the seizure lasts longer than five minutes, you should call an ambulance. Look for a medical bracelet or ID card. It may give you information about the person's seizures and what to do. Once the seizure is over, put them on their side in the recovery position. Stay with them and reassure them as they come round. Never restrain the person. Put something in their mouth or try to give them food or drink. It's not always necessary.
And so, like, the reason you don't want to put anything in their mouth, including, like, your finger, is they can't control their jaw right then, right? And they could break whatever it is, choke on something. Um, and then you put them on their side just in case they vomit. Then they're not um, ingesting that and drowning. Sorry, to call for medical assistance. Call an ambulance if you know it is a person's first seizure. The seizure lasts for more than five minutes. One seizure appears to follow another without the person gaining consciousness in between. The person is injured. You believe the person needs urgent medical attention. For more information about... So like if the person in that initial phase has, you know, hit their head and they're bleeding from their head, yes, call an ambulance, right? Uh, one of my students ended up calling an ambulance when that student had a seizure. Uh, at first, she was sort of like, I wish that no one had done that. But then, like, in retrospect, she was grateful because she didn't realize until they took her in that she had actually just missed taking her anti-seizure medicine that day. And that's what had happened. And they were able to get her stabilized. Biore blemish patches. Absorb plus an oil. Your visible results. So this next one is about um, seizure do detecting dogs. And so one of the things service dogs can be trained to do is to detect when their owners are going to have a seizure and warn them so that the owners can essentially like, get to a safe position, safe place. Um, dogs can also do this for like diabetic shock. Uh, they can do this for respiratory conditions. And there are some dogs that are starting to be able to like sniff out cancers as well. So. In this morning's Health Watch, seizure dogs. About 3 million people in the U.S. have epilepsy, including 300,000 children. A growing number of them are getting help from service dogs called seizure dogs. CBS News correspondent Debbie Turner-Bell has the story of one boy who is now helping himself and others. Debbie, good morning. Good morning to you. You know, when I met seven-year-old Evan Moss, he seemed like pretty much any other little boy, but I soon realized that he has a will to live life to the fullest <coughs> and an amazing ability to inspire others. Little Evan Moss was born with brain tumors that caused frequent seizures. He was having multiple seizures every day, you know, 10 to 15 seizures a day, you know, over 300 seizures a month. Surgery stopped the seizures for almost two years, but they came back. The first time he had a seizure after surgery and we walked into his bedroom, it was Christmas Eve. With the experience we, we had, you would think that we would be equipped to deal with it. It was an unexpected, heartbreaking setback. Seven-year-old Evan now takes 14 pills a night to control his seizures. Can you lay the other way on your bed, though? Which only happen in his sleep. We put him to bed in his bed to give some sense of, of normal life. But then when we go to bed, we, we move him into our bed, and he sleeps in our bed. And we sleep with one hand on him. <laughs> Rob and Lisa Moss search for ways to allow Evan to lead a normal life. A conversation with friends led them to Four Paws for Ability, a facility in Xenia, Ohio, that trains seizure alert dogs. We train the dogs to actually alert the parents um, when they uh, know that a seizure is coming. Let's go, silly. Four Paws for Ability dogs have an 85% success rate in detecting seizures. The secret is in their training. The dog itself we think we're, is going to change our lives, but also at times be a lifesaver for Evan. <laughs> but there was a catch. The Mosses had to come up with $13,000 for the dog. We're not in a position to write a check for $13,000. We knew we had to do some fundraising to make that happen. One day I will get a seizure dog to help me win. So I Evan decided to write a book about his future seizure dog. Fun. And his parents published it themselves, hoping they could sell a few copies to help raise the money. We raised the full amount of Evan's $13,000 need in two days, just from the awareness that was generated around that book signing. At his book signing, more than 600 people showed up. I'm going to say, huger than huge crowd, huger than huge, 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 huge crowd. So I just love kids. They're so pure. <laughs> huger than huge, huge, huge. So far, Evan has raised $41,000, far more than he needs for his dog. 
the seizure dog will go everywhere with me. And right now, Evan is then anxiously waiting to get his off. seizure dog. And he's taking his newfound fame in stride. Maybe you want to be a movie star when you grow up. Well, I kind of probably am, because we are on national TV. <laughs> yes, you are, my friend. <laughs> Evan will get his service dog next June, June of 2012, and the extra money that he has raised will go to help other kids, Jeff, that need C And so these are not cheap things. They're not covered by insurance. Um, so people do have to, like, raise money, but I, they obviously can be life-changing for folks um, and really make a huge difference. Uh there's just so much in this chapter. I'm basically trying to decide what to talk about next. <laughs> All righty. Um, so we'll talk about migraines next. Um, and so uh, these account for a significant number of strokes in young people, actually. Um, and they occur with migraine attacks. Um, and so some people who get migraine headaches will be so severe that they can get a trans transient ischemic attack or that TIA uh, with them. And I know that that's rare and more people do tend to get migraines themselves. And so I have uh, a video, <laughs> this heads up. Uh, the woman who narrates this has an accent, so she's going to say migraine the whole time. Um, and it threw me off the first time I watched it. My celebrity colorist, me. I'm this new Garnier Nutrice. It has five amazing fruit. More than one person in ten suffers from migraine. Migraine. A complaint that can have a serious impact on daily life. Migraine, therefore, is more than just a headache. In this short film, we explain exactly what migraine is and what you can do to limit or even prevent the symptoms. Migraine is a complaint that is connected with a severe form of headache. A migraine attack often starts as a dull headache, which then develops into a throbbing or pounding pain, mostly on one side of the head. This pain can spread further to the neck and shoulders. With a migraine attack, other symptoms can also occur, such as nausea, <coughs> vomiting, and a hypersensitivity to bright light, sound, and even smells. With some patients, a migraine attack begins with an aura. That is the generic term for a number of neurological symptoms, such as flashing light, hallucinations, or other sight disorders, but also sensation disorders, paralysis symptoms, or even speech disorders. The aura usually disappears shortly before the headache occurs, or sometimes it merges with it. The exact cause of migraine is still under research. We do know that migraine is a neurovascular complaint that is related to an overreaction of blood vessels in the brain. Migraine occurs more with younger people than with older people, and more with women than with men. Furthermore, the complaint is hereditary. Migraine patients often know other family members who also suffer from it. Migraine attacks can be provoked when specific factors or situations arise. Such a factor is also known as a trigger. Examples of triggers are specific types of food, drinks, or environment factors. Triggers are very individually determined and vary from patient to patient. For some migraine sufferers, alcohol, stress, or menstruation can be triggers, while for others it might be coffee, chocolate, or a certain smell. So, as a migraine sufferer, it is very important to know your own triggers. Due to the fact that each migraine patient is different, there are various ways to treat or even prevent migraine. In order to limit the seriousness, length, and frequency of migraine, a regular lifestyle is crucial eat, sleep, and move regularly. It is also important to avoid or limit stress. Migraine sufferers can also get to know their personal triggers and then learn to anticipate them. In addition to good hygiene, medicine can also be prescribed to treat or relieve migraine. 
there is acute and preventive medication. Acute medication fights the pain directly the moment it surfaces. If you have more than two or three migraine attacks per month, then preventive medication can help to limit the number of attacks and their intensity. Ask your doctor for advice. Migraine can be very painful and can seriously hinder daily activities. So never say just a headache about a migraine. So migraines, migraines, <laughs> um, uh, as I mentioned, they can have an aura. Um, these auras can last up to 40 minutes for some folks. Um, and what is causing the aura is vasoconstriction, which is whoop, uh, particularly in the occipital cortex, again, back here. Um, and so that's why people will actually sometimes feel like they have tunnel vision as part of the aura because it's, you know, your blood vessels back here and never great. Um, so vasoconstriction happens and then vasodilation takes place. They reopen and then that's where you get that intense pain. As the video mentioned, it might be localized. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it can include nausea and vomiting. Some migraines may last for hours or days. Um, and the most frequent type is just called the common migraine, which makes it sound like so low key, but they are so debilitating for folks. About 80% of migraine sufferers get the quote unquote common ones. Um, other one, other types can actually affect your movement of your limbs or cause anxiety, dizziness, bright spots. Um, uh, so all manner of things, and again, not great at all. So next we're going to talk about infections that can affect the brain, because just like any other part of your body, your brain can be susceptible to certain viral bacterial infections. Um, and so this is invasion of the body by disease producing microorganisms and how your tissue reacts to it. So what happens when an infection crosses that blood brain barrier is that they can interfere with the blood supply to your neurons. They can dis disturb the metabolism within the neurons. So mess up your glucose levels, mess up your oxygen metabolism. They can change your cell membranes, which makes it really difficult to function properly. Uh, you can uh, get edema or hydrocephalus or some sort of fluid. You can also, this is my favorite one, just in my notes, formation of pus. Not good anywhere, especially not good in your brain, right? So viruses themselves, I feel like we've all learned a lot about viruses in the past few years, right? But these are encapsulated aggregates of nucleic acid. So they're made either of DNA or RNA, depending on the virus themselves. And there are different types of viruses. And one that's called neurotropic, they have a love of neural cells. They have a special affinity for the central nervous system cells. You can also get bacteria, uh, microorganisms that have no chlorophyll and multiply by single division. Uh, one of the most dangerous bacterial infections you can get is meningitis, although you can also get a viral version of meningitis, and I do have a brief video about that here. Viral meningitis is an infection occurring mostly in children under age 5. It happens when certain viruses invade the meninges, which are the tissues that cover and protect the brain and spinal cord. The meninges are arranged in three layers. The layer that actually touches the brain and spinal cord is called the pia mater. The spiderweb-like middle layer is called the arachnoid mater. 
The outermost and toughest layer is called the dura mater. Cerebrospinal fluid, which also protects the brain and spinal cord, flows between the meninges and over the surface of the brain. The most common cause of viral meningitis is a type of virus called enterovirus. Other viruses that can cause meningitis include the mumps virus, the measles virus, herpes viruses, and a variety of viruses spread by blood-feeding insects such as mosquitoes and ticks. Um, so a couple quick things. Um, so like herpes related viruses, this is one of the reasons why insanity used to be associated with STIs and like Shakespeare's time. Um, and then yeah, things like Zika, uh, that can be carried by mosquitoes. I mean, we want to be very careful about. Viruses that cause meningitis may be spread through the bite of an infected insect. However, the two most common ways the virus is spread are through fecal contamination, which can happen when hands are not washed after using the toilet or changing a diaper, and through contact with the body fluids from an infected person, such as through sneezing or coughing. Once inside the body, the viruses make copies of themselves and enter the bloodstream. Viruses travel through the bloodstream to the brain, where they cross the border between the bloodstream and the brain into the cerebrospinal fluid. The viruses spread throughout the cerebrospinal fluid and infect the cells of the meninges. The meninges become inflamed as the immune system begins to fight off the infection. Symptoms of viral meningitis in infants and young children include fever, irritability, loss of appetite, and trouble waking up. Symptoms in older children and adults include fever, headache, stiff neck, sensitivity to light, sleepiness, trouble waking up, nausea, vomiting, and loss of appetite. The symptoms of viral meningitis are similar to those of bacterial meningitis, but are usually less severe. Doctors may recommend acetaminophen or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for fever and headache. For meningitis caused by a type of herpes virus, doctors may prescribe an antiviral medication such as acyclovir. There is no treatment for most viruses that cause meningitis, though most people recover on their own within two weeks. And that isn't necessarily the case for bacterial meningitis, unfortunately. Sometimes that is fatal. All right, the next thing that I have here um, is to talk about MS or multiple sclerosis. Um, I was lucky enough to get to work in an, in an MS clinic. There's a lot of vowels there. Um, <laughs> Uh, when I was on my residency and I knew nothing about this disease before I started working there and learned quite a bit. So what happens in MS is that you lose the myelin sheaths around your axons. And so that's like if I took this wire, right, and stripped away the coating, I wouldn't do that because I'd like shock myself, right? But it makes transmission much more inefficient. It also causes all kinds of sort of misfirings and miss signals there. Um, you could also get uh, sclerosis plaques, which are small, hard scarring, essentially, where the myelin sheath has been destroyed. Um, so that makes it even more difficulty. We don't really know what causes it. Some people think it might be a bacterial infection. 
an immune, like it might be an autoimmune disorder, environmental factors, some sort of vitamin deficiency. We still don't have really good answers. So the symptoms that we tend to see are reduced or abnormal sensations, weakness, vision changes, and these can be really scary. The person can be like driving down the street and all of a sudden they can't see. Like it can be that sudden. Um, and they it usually comes back, like it often sort of goes in waves, but in that moment, it's terrifying, right? Clumsiness, loss of bladder control, and where we often came in was to look at memory issues. Um, so things that we see, that physicians will see, altered eye movements, changes in speech patterns, um, when you do the reflex thing with the rubber mallet, their reflexes won't be as good. They'll have impaired coordination if you just do simple things like the finger to nose test. Uh, and sensory disturbances where their body surface sensation, like if you touch it with a light touch or just like a safety pin, they won't respond as the way someone without it would. You also see spasticity and weakness in limbs. Um, this can lead them to needing to use mobility aids, whether it's a cane, a walker, or sometimes a wheelchair. You can do like MRIs. They will show the plaques or the scarring where the myelin sheath is removed. There are other types of tests that you can do as well, including a lumbar puncture, and you can test for immune system proteins there. And sometimes they will also do, a, well, they'll actually always do a blood test to rule out other things. Treatment here, um, you can use uh, steroids. Um, there are two types of main types of MS. One is relapse remitting, where they'll like have an episode and then they'll be okay for a while and then they'll have another one. And then there's a type of MS that's just slowly going downhill. The steroids work for that relapse remitting. Um, when they've had a um, event, especially if it's one of the ones where like you can't see, they'll typically come in for an IV treatment of steroids, but then they can take them orally as well. You can give them interferons to suppress inflammatory factors in the immune system. These also have antiviral properties. Uh, there are other uh, medications you can have them take uh, that, for example, sort of look or act like myelin um, and trick the white blood cells into attacking it instead of the actual myelin sheets. Uh, and immunosuppressive, for the people who have that chronic progressive version, they block certain factors in the immune system that contribute to inflammatory processes. Of course, anytime you're on anything that's messing with your immune system, it means you're that much more vulnerable to other things. So you have to be very cautious, right? Um, people sometimes have a hard time adjusting to the diagnosis and progression. This typically happens to folks in their 30s and 40s, uh, but it can happen much younger. Uh, when I was in the clinic one day, we saw someone who was 17 who had just been diagnosed and she was an athlete. And so this was very life-changing for her. We gave everyone who came into the MS clinic a Beck depression inventory because depression is really common. It can be a result of the disease, but it could also be a symptom of everything being messed up in your brain. You can get depression, not because you're upset by your diagnosis, but literally because of your brain-based changes. In addition to memory issues, we also see difficulties in language, visual spatial issues, uh, executive dysfunction, and decreased speed of information processing. So I have a couple of videos here about MS. I think I'm going to show this one because it's uh, very humanizing, which I like. It's from Canada, obviously. <laughs> cartoon animation at Sheridan College and I think I'm still a cartoonist at heart it's what I'm most passionate about my hopes and dreams for the future is to be there for my children to be a part of their lives 
like any normal mother would be. I have gone skydiving. I have gone scuba diving. I've got my advanced certification in scuba diving because I just absolutely love the feeling of what it's like there. I gotta get out of bed. I gotta get that lunch made. I gotta get her to school. I gotta get those dogs outside. I gotta do whatever I gotta do. And you do, you just do. I'm passionate about politics. It makes me a horrible person, I know. Um, I, I'm i one of the very lucky people who, uh, who actually get to do their hobby for a living. I point out, look at the beautiful sunrise, look at the sunset, oh my gosh, there's a rainbow, look at that pretty flower. If someone says, oh, the weather today is so bad, I'm like, who cares about the weather? The things that you take for granted every single day were all of a sudden just taken from me, literally overnight. The hardest part for me was when I lost my hands. As a cartoonist, as a person who likes to write, I found that losing my hands was the biggest blow. I cannot walk as easily as I would like to from one spot to the next. How do I do it and how is it going to be uh, a way that I can, I can do it to, to lead a normal and independent life? I got to start using a wheelchair. I want to be able to run in the park with my children, which I can't do. I don't have the coordination to put one foot in front of the other to run. I used to ski. I can't ski anymore. It's like so part of our assessment for MS would just be having people walk, I think, like 10 yards up and back and watching their gates and sort of taking notes of where they were struggling. Being hung over all the time without the fun of being drunk. <laughs> um, that's, that's kind of what the fatigue is. It's a full body experience. When I found out my sister had MS, I have to say my reaction was a little bit of even anger. You know, wait a second, how is this fair? Why does she have to go through, you know, what I had to go through? It was also some fear because she's got three young, beautiful girls and worried about how they're going to cope and handle it. But quickly shifted that to, no, you know what? It's going to be more of a support. We're going to be here for each other as we always have. We're we're lucky that we've got a, such a close relationship and we're going to get through this together. And so having that support can be vital, obviously. Um, and in fact, one of the things we did when we were on that rotation is we attended meetings of the event support group to see sort of the psychological processes involved in that as well. Try to get this bad boy to work, and then I'll just walk y'all through the case study so we don't have to do it with so few people. There we go. It's trying. Okay, so this was Danielle, um, and so she was a 36-year-old female, she was married, she had 12-year-old twins, she was at the beach with her family and she felt like her head exploded. At some point, she basically um, thought she, like she got hit in the head by like, a surfboard or something. Uh, she worked as an assistant in daycare in a daycare center for preschool kids. Her health was generally good. Some risk factors that were associated with what happened to her. For example, she was a heavy smoker for 20 years. Uh, she was so if you 10 cigarettes a day at the time that she had her SAH, which we'll talk about what that is in a second. Uh, her father had been diagnosed with lung cancer. Her husband was laid off and was having a hard time finding another job, so there was some financial stress. Uh, she felt like her head had exploded. She had the sensation of being hit in the head. She was drowsy and confused with a severe headache. Uh, she ended up having to have surgery, and then her left arm and left side of her face were weak and numb. 
and she had difficulty speaking clearly. When she did return to work, her fatigue levels were high and she had to rest when her kids napped. Her memory, even for things like the names of children and parents were impaired. Um, she felt not quite with it and very emotional. She could no longer make things in the way she had. And she had some left side visual field deficits. So they had a CT scan to diagnose the initial hemorrhage. There was a moderate amount of blood around the brain. She also had an angiogram and they found a 10 millimeter aneurysm on the bifurcation of her right middle cerebral artery. Uh, and then they did some blood flow studies after surgery and they found some vasos, vasospasms. She had some lowered blood flow and she developed an ischemic defect or a stroke in her right hemisphere. Once they stabilized that vasospasm, they did another MRI and they found the an infarction two centimeters in diameter in her right parietal cortex. They gave her the BDI, uh, so she wasn't depressed. She did have some generalized anxiety. Her pre-morbid IQ was estimated to be average. They did give her um, a waste, so an assess at the time. Her verbal was average. Her performance scores were low average. She had real difficulty with block design and matrix reasoning. Again, this was in her right parietal cortex, which often deals with a lot of these issues uh, in terms of non-verbal abilities. Uh, she didn't do great on the working memory index. Um, so she was having a hard time processing things quickly. The WIMS of WS is a Wexler memory scale. She was low average to average. Uh, that gray complex figure we've looked at before, uh, she drew it very piecemeal. There were details missing. She had some hemi neglect, it seemed. She was average on some of these other tests, like fluency or the Wisconsin card sort, or that um, trail making test is the connect the dots that we looked at before. So it was slower than average, and it took longer on the left side of the page because of that hemi neglect. Um, they did some specific hemi neglect tests. And she showed mild hemi neglect on the left side. Um, however, six months later, she had significant improvement in all of these. So she had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and the arachnoid is sort of this like spider web like layer that's around your whole brain, basically. That was between that and the actual brain tissue. So, in terms of impact on her life and family, her whole family went to therapy. Um, she wasn't allowed to drive anymore, which of course, anytime you have a driver in the family, right, that makes things a little bit more challenging. Um, she gave up smoking. It's good. She didn't return to work, or she did return to work, but again, had some fatigue, felt not quite with it. Um, she discussed this with her boss. Her boss was really understanding. She worked only mornings for a while, then went back to a full day. Um, she was practicing names of new kids and parents. Um, and then her husband was sort of so anxious about her potentially having another SAH that he didn't want to be intimate with her. So that was some issues in their relationship. Um, so they clipped her aneurysm 24 hours after admission to the hospital, uh, but then the condition deteriorated. So they raised her blood pressure and increased volumes of the IV fluids to treat the vasospasm. Uh, and then they gave her a calcium channel blocker to help as well. And that helps protect the cells in the brain from dying, which is good, right? Uh, her arm and face weakness and that numbness was resolved. She was discharged after three weeks with instructions to rest at home. She had really good recovery for the first three months. Um, she planned ways to make life 
easier for her mom. Again, remember her mom was caring for her dad who had lung cancer, so she tried to help them cook and things like that. Um, so I said these were things that like her kids would do for her, her twins, sorry, would do for her. And then she found education really helpful. So they gave her articles about her condition and those helped her understand what was going on. No, I can turn this off. This thing's just been sitting on. Okay. So that gets us into our discussion about stroke. And again, we've talked about this in passing before. We're going to talk in a little more detail. An ischema is a blockage of blood vessels. And I'll write some of this on the board for y'all. And then thrombosis. Uh, thrombosis is the formation of a plug or a clot in the blood vessel. An embolism. Is a clot or a plug that is brought through the blood from a larger vessel to a smaller vessel. It can be a clot, a bubble of air, or a mass of cells. You can also have thickening and hardening of the arteries. Things along those lines. When you have a cerebral hemorrhage, hemorrhage or a subarachnoid hemorrhage like she did, this is massive bleeding into the brain. Um, it's often caused by hypertension or high blood pressure. There's also another distinction here between angiomas and aneurysms. So angiomas are a congenital collection of abnormal blood vessels that divert the normal flow of the blood. And then aneurysms. I can never spell this word properly, so give me a sec. And you're why? Okay. okay. Aneurysms are vascular dilation. That's like a balloon expansion. Um, Causes here can be congenital effects, uh, hypertension, buildup and hardness in the veins, embolisms, or infection. So lots of reasons that one of these can happen. So again, obviously bad. We don't want to be having strokes. They're basically heart attacks in your brain. Um, so I do have a couple things here about SAH specifically to relate us to Danielle. Traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage occurs when an acceleration force, such as the impact of a motor vehicle accident or blunt force trauma, causes the brain to move inside the skull. Rapid movement of the brain puts stress on blood vessels in the subarachnoid space, which causes them to rupture. The subarachnoid space, which is normally filled with cerebrospinal fluid, fills with blood. Compared to a subdural hematoma, bleeding in a subarachnoid hemorrhage is spread diffusely through the subarachnoid space, so it does not produce massive pressure on the brain tissue as rapidly. Complications can arise if the subarachnoid hemorrhage produces cerebral vasospasms, which can lead to permanent brain damage. So again, that's what Danielle had was the vasospasms, but they were able to correct them. And this next one is uh, the experiences of someone who had an SAH. Hi, my name is JP Amelot, and I'm 34 years old and from Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm a stroke survivor. I had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, brain hemorrhage, back in January 3rd of this year. I was in a coma for three months. I woke up in March, paralyzed, couldn't move, I couldn't talk. I had a trach, I was on a ventilator, I was on life support, 
I had six operations, a VP shunt put in my head, coils in my back, a tube in my tummy called a peg tube so I could eat because I couldn't swallow, and um, I could not move my body, my legs, my arms. I was pretty paralyzed and um, it was a really scary experience. I just came back from New York visiting my family over there um, for Christmas and New Year's. We drove back to Boston at a slight headache that evening and I woke up three months later not knowing what hit me. It was like a Twilight Zone episode. So his was more severe than Danielle's. He was in a coma for three months. From hell. Uh, anyway, I spent months and months in rehab and through the goodness of others and through the help of many, many people um, and intensive physical therapy, I was able to walk again. And actually yesterday was the first time I jogged at my gym during my physical therapy session. So I was quite amazed because way back in March when I woke up from my coma, my only dream back then was to walk and to someday, someday feel again something in my feet and my legs and move my arms. And I would look outside my window and just look at all the cars and I'm such a car freak, I love cars. Um, I just bought a new car last year, I bought a Volkswagen CC, I love that car. I literally drove it for two months, November and December, and then I had this unfortunate event in January. So the car was pretty much sitting there in our garage at home that whole year, this whole year. My only dream was to someday just drive again. Anyway, I've been driving since September, August, September this year, and it just feels so great and liberating. And um, I'm very, very fortunate that I'm one of the 5% of people that would ever survive, you know, a subarachnoid hemorrhage attack. And, um, yeah, considering that most people, 50% of people die within three hours of getting it. Thankfully, my mom found me in my room. She thought I was initially having a heart attack. Then she called 911 and was taken to the hospital down the street from my house, and they said, oh, we can't handle this because you're just a small hospital. So they took, they took me um, by ambulance to Beth Israel Hospital, and then on the way there, I was already dying. I, I literally died for 15 seconds. They had to electric shock me a number of times just to revive my heart again. Anyway, after coils and a shunt and, you know, six operations later, here I am. And um, I just have to say that I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for my mom prayers of my friends and family back home in the Philippines and New York and here in Boston. And, um, yeah, I just had to focus on getting better. I, I could not give up. And so if you're touched by this, you can watch more of this video later. I mean, he's fairly young in his early 30s when this happened. So this was obviously very life changing for him. Um, this next video illustrates the various types of stroke. Thanks, honey. Wait, Wawa has pizza? Wawa has pizza? A stroke, also called brain attack or cerebral vascular accident, occurs when brain cells die from oxygen deprivation. Oxygen deprivation occurs if blood flow to the brain is blocked by a clot or if vessels are damaged. Without oxygen, brain cells cannot function. There are two types of stroke, hemorrhagic and ischemic. A hemorrhagic stroke occurs when a blood vessel in the brain bursts due to high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, or a congenital malformation. And that atherosclerosis is like when you have high cholesterol and uh, gunk builds up inside of your blood vessels, apparently, uh, essentially. A burst vessel causes bleeding into the brain and decreased blood flow in the damaged vessel. 
blood buildup increases pressure in the brain, damaging nerve cells and collapsing smaller vessels. The second type of stroke is ischemic stroke, which occurs when blood flow through a vessel is blocked. There are three categories of ischemic stroke, thrombotic, thromboembolic, and embolic. A thrombotic stroke occurs when flow in a blood vessel in the brain is obstructed by arterial sclerosis. A thromboembolic stroke occurs when a clot breaks off from an arteriosclerotic plaque and lodges in a downstream vessel blocking blood flow. So that was really fast. <laughs> I don't know if you could tell what was happening. Essentially what will happen is this gunk will build up from high cholesterol, et cetera, in larger blood vessels. And then when it breaks off, it'll kind of drift downstream and then end up in a smaller blood vessel, which isn't wide enough to let it pass. And that's when it blocks it. An embolic stroke occurs when a clot travels to the brain from elsewhere in the body. Patients with atrial fibrillation or who have suffered a heart attack are at high risk of embolic stroke. This is because slow, irregular, or interrupted blood flow has a tendency to clot. Actually, when I was a teenager, um, this is how my dance teacher passed away. Is, uh, she had a blood clot in her leg. They had no idea and uh, dislodged in the middle of the night and she just didn't wake up. Um, so this certainly, and she was the early 50s, I think. So we don't think of that as an age where you think about people having strokes. Sometimes an individual will experience a transient ischemic attack, TIA, which is temporary and improves before cells die. A TIA is a precursor to a thrombotic stroke or short-term embolus. And what can happen with the TIAs is that people can get um, quite a lot of them over time. And so it's like, if you, if they're not diagnosed, and again, they can just look like an abscess seizure. Um, like essentially people will just kind of keep getting worse, keeping worse until they either are diagnosed or have one of those big stroke incidents, unfortunately. And so vascular dementia, which you can get having these types of strokes, is really interesting because essentially what distinguishes it from other dementias, like let's say Alzheimer's disease, is that the flow for Alzheimer's is pretty steady. Whereas essentially you'll be fine with this and then you'll have a TIA, your functioning will go down. You'll be fine for a while and then you have another TIA and your functioning goes down, right? And how much functioning goes down and where just depends on where the TIA is and how big it is. And so um, they want to get those diagnosed. They want to get those treated if they can early on so it doesn't progress. Um, one of the things that we heard from the SAH story is that he was in a coma for three months. Uh, and so this is a demonstration of the Glasgow coma scale, which we use to determine essentially how deep the coma is. In this case, the patient has spontaneous eye opening and scores four. Hello, Mr. Murray, can you hear me? Here, the score is three, as he only opens his eyes to speech. If the patient only responds to a painful stimulus, he scores two on eye opening. So this would be like they, they wouldn't like really hurt you, but they prick you with a pen or something. And in this instance, there is no response and therefore a score of one. When assessing eye opening to pain, you should use nail bed pressure. A supraorbital pressure will only cause the patient to grimace. And so you can sort of determine whether a patient who's in a coma might be more likely to wake up by looking at some of the things here. All right. Last thing we're going to talk about today is um, tumors. Touch on those. So uh, 
this is like cancer anywhere else in the body. It just happens to be in the brain and so can cause very distinct issues because of that. It's a mass of tissue that persists and grows independently of other areas of the body. You can have a tumor that's benign. That's the best. That means it's non-cancerous. Sometimes you don't even have to take it out, depending. Uh, sometimes you'll still remove it. Um, and then you can have malignant tumors. And those are the cancers. So those are the ones you, you don't want, right? And it depends on the type of cancer, how problematic it's going to be. Malignant tumors are likely to recur after removal. They can be progressive and life-threatening. Uh, you can have in the brain a glioma. And that means it arises from the glial cells. Pretty easy to remember. You can have a meningioma. Okay, meningioma. And this are these are growths attached to the meninges. Again, fairly easy to remember. And then you can also have what's called a metastatic. tumor. And this occurs when you've got cancer somewhere else in the body and then it transfers to the brain. So you get lung cancer and it travels to the brain and spreads, right? Um, not too long. No, I guess a while ago now. Uh, we actually had a professor here who was, again, fairly young. I think she was in her 50s who died of uh, uterine cancer because it just became metastatic and spread everywhere really quickly. Um, it was really sad. Uh, so that certainly can happen. She was in uh, representation, probably. I'm just double checking that we didn't miss anything today. I don't think that we did. So because we, I just walked you through, we saved some time on the um, case study. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll end a little early today. Uh, and then starting Wednesday, we're gonna start talking about recovery of function um, and how far we've come and how we can help people recover.